Hello, I'm Manoj Karmakar. Welcome to ISSPS TV. Through this channel, we hope to bring you quality education in regional anesthesia. If you like any of our videos, then do remember to click the like and share button. If you are new to our channel, do remember to subscribe so that you can get regular notification of any future uploads. What I'm going to do is in the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about ultrasound imaging of the lumbar spine uh, and how it's, uh, you could use it uh, for central neuraxial blocks. In the second half after that, I would uh, dwell into some of the technical aspects of uh, how to perform central neuraxial box using ultrasound with the knowledge that we have all acquired now. So uh, in, the, in the first part, I'm going to talk about sonar anatomy, the ultrasound imaging techniques, and how you could use it in, uh, in clinical practice. Uh, I have no conflict of interest to declare, but whenever you see this red star, it usually means it's an important take-home message. So if you take home a few of these, I've done my job. So let's uh, try and get as many home as possible. Now, when you look for ultrasound for central neuraxial blocks, it is actually an integral part of our, uh, of our clinical practice. We do it day in and day out. And when you look at its historical considerations, it was Leonard Corning and August Baer in the 1800s, who actually described epidural and spinal injections, respectively. There was some debate whether Corning's injection that he claimed was a spinal was indeed a spinal, but actually he never reported any fluid emerging, so emerging from the end of the needle. So his was considered an epidural. The August Baer's was indeed a spinal injection. Central neuraxials today are the gold standard for obstetric anesthesia. Success depends on your ability to identify the epidural or the intrathecal space. You rely on surface anatomical landmarks to identify these landmarks and then perform the, the neuraxial intervention. Anatomical landmarks are useful, but as Bernard mentioned, that Variation or variety is the spice of life, if you may. Variation is very common, and they vary among patients. And more importantly, it's difficult to identify these landmarks before needle insertion. And identifying these landmarks in the obese can be very challenging. Also, when you look at the current methods of identifying the epidural space, i.e., we use loss of resistance or the free efflux of CSFs as our endpoint for epidural and spinal injection res respectively. Uh, loss of resistance is a blind technique. Failure rates vary from 5 to 7%. And complications, although rare, still continue to occur. Actually, if you look at uh, the reported incidents, this is a large uh, retrospective cohort of patients where they looked at about 20,000 um, neuraxial blocks in, in the obstetrical population, you can see that the, there is an extremely high success rate of about 95 to 98%, and the failure rates are low. And this is exactly what you do, ladies and gentlemen. However, we are, seem to be quite happy when you have a spinal anesthetic failure of about 5%, and you convert them to general anesthesia. And the retrospective data suggests that there is a low rate of complications, even dural puncture. This is another major um, audit that was conducted by the Royal College of Anesthetists, and they looked at the incidence of complication. They found that the incidence of major complication was, was rare after central neuroaxial blocks. And when they occurred, they're usually transient and very rarely and they said that the most optimistic rate of serious complications are actually less than one in every 100,000 neuraxial blocks. So that's an extremely low incidence of complications with the landmark-based technique. Now, let's take a look at how accurate is your ability to identify a given landmark using palpation. 
In the early 2000s, there were a number of investigations where investigators looked at your ability to identify the given lumbar interspace using palpation when compared with ultrasound, CT, or MR imaging. Cumulative data suggests that palpation is very inaccurate. You correctly identify the spaces only about 30% of the time. There's a tendency to identify an interspace higher than you intend, and accuracy is often affected by obesity, and higher up the lumbar, higher up the spinal column you go. So that means if you're trying to identify a specific lumbar, uh, thoracic interspace, you're probably never going to be correct unless you use some alternative methods of uh, identifying the space. So therefore, the intercrystal line that we all anesthesiologists are taught and we have grown up to, to use during neuraxial block is actually not a reliable landmark for neuraxial anesthesia. So since we are talking about spinal sonography, I think it would be apt to ask this question, is there a role for ultrasound? Actually, when you look at spinal sonography, it's not something new. Spinal sonography has been used in the field of diagnostic radiology since the 1980s. And it's been used in neonates and infants as a first-line screening test for spinal dysraphism, detecting tumors, vascular malformation, etc. It's understandable because it's not possible to take these young children into the MR suite or into the, put them into a gantry. Also, when you look at uh, ultrasound imaging of the spine in, um, in, uh, in, in the neonates, Professor Morgul illustrated in, uh, very eloquently in uh, some, one of the cadaver images. And um, you can see that because of the incomplete ossification of the posterior elements, you can see, as you can see in the ultrasound image to your, to your right here, uh, you can see the neuraxial anatomy very clearly. Therefore, uh, it can, in fact, supplant CT and MR imaging. And in fact, the diagnostic sensitivity is comparable to an MRI in these young babies. But that's not the case in adults. What about in adults? Actually, it is quite interesting that it was first described in the Russian literature in 1971. Now, I mentioned it was used in 1980s for for spinal sonography in units, but actually in the Russian literature, it's there even before that. Bogin and his co-workers used it to perform lumbar puncture. In anesthesiology, it was first reported by Koch in 1980. Another individual that I have great respect for is Dr. Thomas Grau, who actually, with the limited resolution of the ultrasound images he had at the time, but still persevered and showed us actually how you could use ultrasound to perform these neuraxial blocks. And today it is, ultrasound is used both in adults and children. This is Dr. Thomas Grau and a much younger me uh, many years ago in, in Toronto, Dr. Thomas Grau from Germany. Also, it's very interesting to look at some of these images that are published in the literature. As you can see here, these structures have been labeled as ligament and flavum, vertebral body, etc. Now, it's very easy to criticize this quality of these images, but actually, at the time when you had, this is all that you had, shows that how visionary they were. They were able to identify at, at least where these structures were located, given the anatomical structures that they were able to see in the sono anatomy. This is Dr. A, present, uh, a report by Dr. Thomas Grau. Again, you can see he has very painstakingly labeled all the structures to, in this uh, fuzzy gray and white image and how correct he was. And he used this in his clinical practice to perform central neuraxial blocks. Ultrasound imaging has come a long way. There's been um, remarkable improvements in ultrasound technology, both in hardware and software, uh, so much so that today we are able to identify the images of this neuraxis with exceptional clarity. You can see here, and this was also prelude, as a prelude Dr. Bernard Morigal showed you, that this is indeed the paramedian sagittal oblique view of the lumbar spine, and I will come to that more in, in, in a short while. But I also like to show you the image to the right. This is actually a real-time image acquired using biplanar imaging. And the, on the left, you have a 2D image, but on the, on, the, on the 
on your right, you have a biplanar image where you are not only seeing a sagittal view of the L4-5 intervertible space, but you're also seeing a transverse view of the right hemi spine, if you may. You can see that because we are doing a, a, a right-sided paramedian scan, this is L4-5, you can see the right half of the thecal sac uh, in a transverse view. So you can simultaneously see, uh, concurrently see both the sagittal and the transverse view. If time permits, I will dwell more into this uh, in the later part. Now, when you look at ultrasound for neuraxial blocks, I think before you go into it, I think it is important to look at some of the basic considerations. The spine is located at a depth, so therefore you will use low frequency ultrasound. Now, it's often described that low frequency ultrasound has good penetration, but it lacks resolution at the depth. I think this statement is becoming more fuzzy at the moment because as ultrasound technology is improving and the software's um, uh, processing of the data that uh, we acquire is, is improving, I think you can get extremely good images even with low frequency ultrasound. However, the bony uh, structures that are uh, in the path of your ultrasound beam, so the bones are actually a hindrance. They impede the passage of ultrasound and therefore they cast a shadow. This creates a narrow acoustic window. So in the spinal um, architecture, if you may, it's important to understand where the crevices or the openings are through which you can drive the ultrasound beam or direct the ultrasound beam to see the neuraxial structures. So therefore, it is very important to know what these neuraxial osseous elements are so that you can find the narrow acoustic window that I have been alluding to. Now, let's take a look at some of the osseous elements, and I think the previous speakers have already spoken at length. What we really are of interest is the, the vertebral arch, which as you can see, it, the shape varies as they have already alluded to. And if you look at this, it's more triangular and it's probably L5 level. You can see this is formed by part of the pedicle, the lamina, and the lamina on the other side with the spinous process. Now, since we do epidurals and spinals from the posterior aspect, uh, it is uh, important to identify these structures when you are doing your neuraxial intervention. Also, the, uh, the, the openings that allow you to perform these, inter uh, these interventions and the ultrasound imaging is through the interlamellar spaces or through the intraspinous spaces. And as the previous speakers have already um, alluded to, these can vary uh, from patient to patient uh, and within the same patient per se. Now, as I mentioned, in my journey and really understanding the anatomy of the spine, when I started off on this journey, I really uh, didn't know where to, where to start. But when I thought about it, I, I felt that if the neuraxis is wrapped around by the bone, as you can see here in this rotating image, you can see that the neuraxial structures are actually wrapped around by bone, where which have openings. So in order to really be able to accurately identify these opening, I need to know the bony structures first. So this is the basis of the water-based phantom that we initially used to study the osseous anatomy. It's very simple. You can create it in your laboratory, in your home, uh, or in your hospital. Uh, you immerse it in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a tub of water, like you see here, in the plastic tub we have. And then you perform a scan in the transverse sagittal uh, image uh, plane and whatever um, planes that we are going to describe. And you will see how truly you can identify these structures, so much so that we found that every osseous element has a signature appearance, like every one looks different from the other. Actually, the bony elements on an ultrasound also look very different. So this is a, a sequence of image where you can see the transverse view of the sp spinous process with the lamina on the side. This is um, just a transverse spinous process view, if you may. And this is a median sagittal view at the level of the spinous process, you can see the crescent-shaped spinous process with the um, interspinous space. 
As you go paramedian, the first structure you see is the lamina. This is how the lamina appear. They appear repeating patterns with a gap, which are the interlamellar spaces. And if you go further laterally, you start to see the articular processes, processes which overlap to form the facet joints, and they are seen like a continuous wavy line. In contrast to the lamina, where there is an opening, at the level of the articular process, there are no openings. So you can uh, easily understand that we are really aiming for the interlamellar space when you're performing an interlamellar um, intervention. Also, the water phantom is quite a useful um, tool because it because you can see through water. So if you, for the beginners and the novices, if you place a, a needle on the structure and you perform the scan, you can immediately validate what you are seeing on the ultrasound scan. And therefore you can identify what a lamina looks like on a sagittal view and what an articular process looks like. If you go further laterally, you can see the transverse cuts or the axial cuts, transverse views of the spinous processes with their corresponding acoustic shadow. Also ultrasonography of the spine, and in fact, for that matter, in most uh, situations, is a case of recognizing patterns. A few patterns emerge in our in our obs in early observations when we looked at some of these images. This is a transverse interspinous view, as you can see here. We are doing a transverse interspinous view. You can see here it creates this osseous pattern. You can see the articular processes. In fact, the superior inferior to form the uh, facet joints here. You can see the transverse processes laterally. This is the spinal canal, and this is the posterior surface of the vertebral body, which is the very bright line here. So uh, one of my residents said, oh, that looks like a cat's head. You can see here that there is some similarity when you look at the osseous pattern here. The ears of the cat actually represent the articular processes and the whiskers, if you may, appear like the, like the transverse processes. These are the level of the articular processes. Uh, to us, it appeared like they look more like the camel's hump. Sorry, these are the uh, lamina. So you can see they look more like the horse heads and the intervening area has gaps, which are the, uh, which are the interlamellar spaces. Further laterally, you see the articular processes, which are more like the humps of the camel. So if you keep these sonographic uh, patterns in mind and you perform a scan, before trying to look at the neuraxial structure, I would urge you first try and identify what osseous elements are you visualizing. That gives you an idea where your ultrasound plane is, is located. And as Dr. Shia alluded to previously that the ultrasound plane is actually only about a millimeter in, in thickness, if you may. So if your ultrasound beam is one millimeter to the right or the left, it may actually be uh, insonating a different structure. Now let's take a look at uh, in vivo. Let's put this together into uh, in vivo um, in, a, in a patient or in a volunteer, as you can see here. We're doing a transverse scan. Uh, this is a transverse scan. This is a paramedian sagittal scan. The paramedian, because it is to the right of, um, of the median plane, which is the midline, and we are doing a paramedian sagittal scan. So the transverse scan is performed at the level of the spinous process. So this would be described as a transverse spinous process view. Uh, as you can see in this uh, multiplanar view of the phantom, of uh, osseous phantom, we have sh we are showing a CT. We've re rendered it with a CT. You can see this is the spinous process. This is a sagittal view of the spinous process. We are not so familiar with the coronal view, but I often find the coronal view very informative when you're looking at anatomy, when you're looking at the spread of the drug. But anyway, that's for another day. When you do a transverse spinous process view, this is what you see. You can see a very bright spot here, which is indeed the spinous process. And anteriorly, you see a large acoustic shadow. Now, this acoustic shadow actually shows the outline of the lamina laterally and the spinous process posteriorly. Anteriorly, you have this large acoustic shadow, which is caused by this bone. As we said, it doesn't allow you to, um, the bone is 
would um, is impervious to bone. So you get this acoustic shadow. So this window would not be very good if you're looking for the neurexis, but it'd be very good if you're looking for the midline. So the main application of this in clinical practice is to identify the midline. Now, in this individual, you could very well much as well be able to palpate the spinous process. But when you have an obese individual where the spinous process may be over here, then this osseous Sona anatomy can be very useful to identify the midline. As you can see in this correlative image, you can see this is the CT of uh, this at the level of the spinous process. There's good correlation, and uh, it indeed reflects what you see in um, in, uh, in 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 vivo in, in in an individual. Let's go a little bit further. You get the transverse interspinous view. Remember the cat's head. So we are doing a transverse interspinous. Now the spinous process is no longer there to obstruct your ultrasound plane. So you see the articular processes and the transverse process laterally. And thereby you can see now, you can see the, there's no acoustic shadow. You're seeing the lateral elements, which are the articular processes. This is the posterior surface of the vertebral body, which now forms the anterior complex. This is indeed a complex that is made up of the posterior surface of the vertebral body, the anterior, the posterior longitudinal ligament, and the anterior dura. And uh, Professor Morigal showed you that in this cadaver anatomic section. You can see the posterior dura very vividly and very clearly posteriorly. So now, where would you use this sonographic image? Obviously, needless to say, you can look at the internal caliper, uh, the, the scale on the right of the image. You can see you can very well uh, determine what the depth of this dura is in this individual. You can use the internal caliper in the ultrasound system to measure the depth. As you can see here, it correlates very well with the transverse interspinous view uh, that uh, we were talking about. And as uh, Dr. Shia mentioned, you can see that this shape of the spinal canal varies whether you are performing the scan higher up or lower down in the lumbar region. And this may have an if it may influence uh, what we do in clinical practice. So therefore, you can see here we are measuring the depth to the to the dura. More importantly, you can also see that uh, you can see the symmetry between either side. You can see the lateral elements are very symmetrically located, not exactly symmetrically, often as, uh, again, the previous speakers have alluded to, absolute symmetry is not always the case. There is some variation like the position of the spinous process in the midline are not absolutely in the midline. Some of the, some lateral deviation from the midline is the is the norm. Similarly, there may be some variation in the position of the articular processes, but in general, they are relatively symmetrical. When you see asymmetry in the position of the articular processes with the in the transverse interspinous view, it's a telltale sign that there may be some rotational defect in this individual. And very commonly, you can see it in scoliosis. So the sagittal view often provides sagittal scan or the sagittal window often provides better view of the lumbar uh, neuraxis. This is because there are fewer osseous elements to obstruct the ultrasound beam. And therefore, the ultrasound beam um, is very easily um, projected onto the, on, onto the spinal canal and the meninges. But for anyway, for completeness, we must talk a little bit about the spinous process window, the median spinous process window, which is right in the midline. You can see here, this is uh, the, the sagittal window here in the median plane. You can um, see it as uh, these crescent shapes shaped and the interspinous view here. Uh, very rarely used in clinical practice, but for completeness, I think this is useful to, to describe this. Again, it's got a very good correlation to what you see in, um, in a CT or in an anatomical or an MRI image. It's the paramedian window that is often used for cl in clinical practice for neuraxial blocks. We do a paramedian sagittal scan. It is important to identify what neuraxial structures you are seeing. As I showed you in the osseous um, a water phantom, water phantom that each osseous element, i.e. the lamina, the articular process, and the transverse process appear different. Uh, by performing the scan, you'll be able to recognize what level you are performing the sagittal scan. Also, when you perform a sagittal scan, you should have a routine. We often suggest that you perform the start, start the scan from the sacrum. 
because the sacrum is a large flat surface, as you can see here in this water phantom, the first gap that you will see will be the will be the uh, lumbosacral junction, which is the lamina, uh, the inter uh, space, interlaminar space between the L5 and the S1. Once you recognize that, as you translate the transducer more carefully, you can identify L4, L3, L2, etc. And this is how you can count up to identify a given lumbar interspace. Also, another important um, anatomical feature of the lumbosacral junction or the L5-S1 gap is that the sacrum is usually directed posteriorly. As you can see here, the L5-S1 space is usually closer to the skin um, as opposed to the L4, L5, or the L3, L4 space. So it's often, for any given patient, it's, um, it's usually a little more superficial than uh, the other spaces that we often perform the intervention. As you can see here, this is the lamina of L5. This is the, the first sacral vertebra and the sacrum with a large acoustic shadow. In the acoustic window between the two, from a posterior to anterior in the L5-S1 gap, you can see the interlaminar um, ligaments, the uh, ligament of flavum, the posterior dura, and the hypoechoic ligament, the epidural space. And as uh, as the previous speakers have alluded to, the epidural space at L5-S1 is usually very narrow. Also, you can see the intrathecal space here and the anterior complex. Now, these structures may represent the chorda equina. What you don't see here is actually, this entire space is actually filled with the, the horse's tail, which is the equina, the chorda equina. And therefore, it's not surprising that when you sometimes perform spinal injections or you do interventions, intrathecal injections through the L5-S1, you may find patients often may report paresthesia. So this is just to show you um, in more detail how the L5-S1 space appears. You can see here, uh, this patient actually has, a, has had previous surgery, so there is some uh, artifacts uh, being created by the fibrous tissue, but you can see the sacrum here, the lamina of L5, and the interlaminar space. Also, if you note, the thecal sac here is, appears to be tapering as opposed to when you look at it at L4, L5, it appears to be narrower than at the L4, L5. Nevertheless, the L4, L5, L5, S1 is a large uh, interlamellar space and a large space. Once you have identified the lamina of L5, you can move the transducer cephalad, and we say you can count cephalad to identify the lamina of L3, 4, and 5. So this is the lamina view. We are paramedian, sagittal at the level of the lamina, but actually the optimal window for imaging the neuraxis, you know, the paramedian lamina window is actually not a true sagittal window. It is actually a paramedian, sagittal, but slightly oblique plane. So I often say to my fellows that there's a little twist in it. Now, there is no arithmetic number or degree that you can I can mention to you that you should apply, but it is often a case of dynamically you have to apply some degree of medial tilt uh, till you can see the posterior dura and its other associated structure more clearly. It's not only a case of, of, uh, of tilting the transducer, often there is some degree of slide, and I will uh, demonstrate that in the, in the live demonstration later on. So uh, this is the lamina view in this multiplanar view in this phantom. Again, it's a CT. Uh, and uh, you can see this is the paramedian. It's a sagittal, and it's an oblique view of the lumbar um, L3, 4, and 5. You can see here the epidural space posterior is very clearly visualized. It's a few millimeters wide. You can see the very bright uh, posterior dura. Uh, and you can also see the thecal sac anteriorly. Uh, and this is the thecal sac with some fine um, reflections here, which echo, echoes from the, this, this may represent the coda equina and the anterior dura, uh, the anterior complex, which is actually a composite image of the posterior surface of the vertebral body, or sometimes it could even be the intervertebral disc, the uh, posterior longitudinal ligament and the anterior dura. Now I often say, 
we really don't have much business here uh, in this anterior epidural space unless you are a pain physician, maybe. Uh, and But for anesthesiologists, we don't have any business here. So I often say we can club it all together as the anterior complex. Now, the anterior complex can be very useful. While we are often focused on the posterior complex to perform the intervention, actually the width of the anterior complex tells you how wide that interlamellar space is. So when you're performing a paramedian, surgeons can look out for the anterior complex because the anterior complex width often correlates well with uh, the, um, the width of the interlamellar space and the uh, acoustic window that you can uh, achieve at that spot. As you see here, this is the L345 uh, space. And you can see today with the ultrasound imaging technology we have, you can see excluded images uh, and all it needs is just to insert a needle and you can see the, the horse heads and the intervening uh, gaps are the interlamellar spaces with the ligament of flavum, the epidural space and the, and the posterior dura. Okay, very recently there has been um, a publication by Dr. Conroy, Bluet, Pauline McCartney and McCarty from uh, Canada uh, and they describe this as an alternative approach. But actually, when I looked at the images, it's quite interesting. They set the patient up, they perform a scan, and they place the transducer with a slight pivot. It's a paramedian sagittal scan, but the cranial end is pivoted towards the spinous process. I also remember actually reading a paper by uh, Dr. Morgul and their group uh, using the same approach when they do paravertebral imaging. So this is nothing very new, really. But it's not a transverse scan. It's not a true paramedian sagittal scan. I can only say that this is a spinal laminar view because you are pivoting the medial end slightly uh, the cranial end slightly more medial, and this may circumvent the need for the medial um, orientation or the medial tilt that we require during the um, paramedian sagittal scan. And this is a, a real-time view for you. You can see the spinous process in this ultrasound window to your left. You can see the spinous process here, and uh, on the cranial caudal side, you can see the lamina. And in this intervening gap, you can see the posterior dura, uh, the thick ligaments uh, laterally and the anterior complex with the thecal sac medially. This seems to be an interesting window, uh, although I don't use it, but I'm becoming more of a fan of this and would like to try this out in my clinical practice. So what do you do with the articular process view? This is a view where you just perform the scan a little bit more lateral. You will see the continuous wavy line, which is the articular processes articulating with one another with no intervening gaps. Now, this can be of use to pain physicians who are interested in performing periarticular um, facet joint injections or identifying the articular processes before they turn it to a transverse view to identify the articular process. But as, um, as an anesthesiologist, when you perform neuraxial blocks, if you see this window or this, this sort of, um, more morphological appearance, then it usually means your ultrasound beam is too lateral. It's telling you please guide the needle, the, the beam more, more medially because your lamina is more medially. So this is the camel hump sign that we often describe. And as I said, the, um, you can see it very clearly in this, they are all articulating one on the superior and inferior of the inferior from the, the vertebra above. And you can see here also the sacrum is actually directed a bit posteriorly making the L5S1 closer to the skin. The transverse process view comes more laterally, you can see here. Um, this is usually more relevant when we are performing scans for, let's say, lumbar plexus, or we want to scan the psoas or the lumbar nerve roots. Uh, and you can see here, uh, this is a paramedian sagittal view at the level of the transverse process. It creates an axial view of these cuts of these transverse processes with the acoustic shadows. In the intervening gaps, you can see the large thick psoas muscle. Uh, and the lumbar plexus is usually located in the posterior part of this, uh, of this um, muscle bundle here. They're located more in the posterior part. And since they are quite caudally directed, as um, Dr. Shia alluded to, We've also demonstrated that they, once they exit the, the intervertebral foramina or the intervertebral canal, they actually direct it quite caudally. So when you perform the scan, it may be it is required to slide, do a slightly 
try and mimic that angle to see how the how the spinal nerves are actually um, following the psoas. You can see here these transverse processes uh, and the lumbar plexus nerves within the. Now we will talk more about this when we talk about lumbar paravertebral scanning. This uh, sonographic pattern has been described, we have described as the trident sign because of its similarity to the trident or Poseidon. And if you are an Indian like me, then it would relate to the um, Trishul of the Hindu god Shiva. Okay, now with this sonographic uh, um, information, it is quite clear that you can perform a quite clear imaging of the transverse and sagittal view. While the transverse view is useful for identifying the midline, and probably in, um, in some individuals, you can also do the interspinous view and perform uh, measurements uh, and uh, predict how deep the epidural space is or the thecal sac is. The paramedian window usually provides you better view of the neuraxis. So how do you use it in clinical practice? We can use it to pre as a preview scan. So that means you do it as a pre-procedural scan. You do what you normally do with your, um, with your landmarks and touch and feel loss of resistance, but you perform a pre-procedural scan to supplant your landmark technique by identifying the midline. As you can see, I showed you the window where you can use it to identify the midline. You can ad accurately identifying a lumbar intervertebral space. Now, it is more accurate than palpation, but it's not 100% because there are times when you may have um, lumbarization or, or sacralization of the lumbar vertebra. So the true L5-S1 may not always be an L5-S1, but this happens in less than 10% of individuals. So I, I would say that you're accurate in 90% of the time. We can predict the depth to the dura and epidural spaces, and there is a lot of literature documenting the good correlation. Uh, you can also identify if there are rotational defects. Now, while this is important, uh, we will discuss more about this when we discuss about scoliosis and how you do interventions in those, in those patients. So don't miss out the webinar where we'll be talking about this. And Dr. Shia will also be presenting a lot of uh, useful information about scoliosis and other uh, inflammatory disease in these cases. Also, you can find out the optimal site for needle insertion. Now we say so because if you find that the ultrasound view of a given lumbar interspace is um, better than the other, then it's probably um, common sense to perform the intervention there because this would, because this, the neuraxis is better visualized, so this interspace is also probably uh, much wider. Um, Dr. Chin, again, uh, he is from Canada and very well known in this area, also demonstrated that the visibility of the neuraxis can also be used to predict the ease or difficulty of the neura intervention. So in patients where ultrasound imaging is poor, these are patients where you'll also have a lot of difficulty performing uh, neuraxial blocks. So it's telling you maybe you should use ultrasound in these patients uh, as real time to uh, facilitate uh, um, success, uh, and rather than to have to perform multiple uh, needle insertions. And overall, uh, there are cumulative evidence which suggests that it improves the first pass success. So it offers some technical advantages. Now, it can never improve the, uh, the success rate because as I alluded to in my earlier slides that the success rate of spinals and epidurals are about more than 95%. So in order to sh show statistical differences, you would need a large sample of patients, and I don't think such uh, would be easily demonstrable in clinical practice. But certainly, uh, published evidence is that it improved the first pass success, reduced technical complications during it, like um, it reduces post-operative headache, post-operative backache in the patients that have uh, ultrasound guided. And there's also some evidence that has just emerged that when you use um, ultrasound guidance as a pre-procedural intervention, even as a pre-procedural intervention, it reduces the uh, incidence of uh, the possibility of bloody tap or uh, aspirating blood to the catheter. Finally, you can also use it to use it for real-time ultrasound guidance. And I will uh, discuss more about this in my next presentation. So finally, the concluding remarks is today with the technology we have, it is very easily possible to perform 
accurate ident identification of the uh, of not only the osseous structures but also the um, the neuraxial structures, and this is facilitating us in performing yeah. interventions of uh, neuraxial blocks. Whether you use it as a pre-interventional tool, like a pre-procedural scan, or you use it in real time. Uh, I think we will come to that in my next presentation. So please hold on. Um, so if you want some references for future reading, these are some papers that we have been I've been involved with. The first one is a review in anesthesiology. Second one is uh, in the British Journal of Radiology, talking about the sonar anatomy of the spine. And you can uh, get all the details that we have just discussed.